In this video, we're going to talk about how to put together power functions into more complex functions, such as polynomials and rational functions, and then use the power analysis from before to allow us to sketch more complex functions fairly easily. So the first type of function we're going to take a look at is polynomial function. Polynomial function is a function of this form where your x's are your variables, but all of the a's are constants coefficients. So in fact polynomial functions are simply a bunch of power functions put together with addition or subtraction in between. Graphs of these functions are very nice smooth curves. There's no asymptotes, there's no holes, there's nothing um, unexpected going on and therefore they should be fairly straightforward to sketch. Let's take a look at our first sketch example here. We're going to sketch x cubed minus 4x which is a cubic polynomial function. Now, the very first thing to do when you sketch any function is to maybe try to come up with some points to be able to put on the graph. And the nicest types of points are, of course, intercepts. So let's take a look at what are the x-intercepts of, of this function. So for the x-intercepts, we would like to set y to be 0. So we're going to have x cubed minus 4x equals 0. Now, if you would once again like um, a more thorough review of how to solve various types of equations, please take a look at the pre-calculus review package. There's lots of practice problems, um, videos, and um, other examples there. So what we would like to do, first of all, is to see, is there anything that we can factor out? And we notice that in this example, both of our terms have x in common. So we can take out 1x, and this will leave us with x squared minus 4. And then the nice thing about factoring is that if you have 0 on the other side, it now means that I have a product of two things equals 0. Well, the only way to multiply two numbers and get a 0 is if one of the two numbers you multiplied was 0. So that means either x is 0 or this bracket is 0, x squared minus 4. So x squared minus 4 is 0 means x squared is 4. And now we got to be careful, don't forget the negative root, because this gives us that x is equal to plus or minus 2. Okay, and once you have some points, it's probably best to put them on the graph right away. Okay, so let's have a little graph going on right here. Okay, so what do we have? In terms of our points, I know that my x-intercepts of my graph are going to be at 0 and at negative 2 and positive 2. Okay, so these three points I already know are going to be on my graph and this might guide um, what the graph look like in a little bit. Okay, now let's think of the power analysis that we used earlier. Remember that in our power analysis we said that small powers dominate near the origin and large powers dominate further away from the origin. So taking a look at our function here, let's think in terms of smallest and largest powers. So I have two terms to pick from, x cubed and minus 4x. The one with the smaller power will dictate the behavior near the origin, and the one with the larger power will dictate the behavior at the ends for large values of x. So clearly the one with the smaller power is minus 4x here, so I know for a fact that this will be for near the origin behavior and the larger power x cubed will dictate my behavior for large values of x. Now it is important here to be sure that you've actually captured the behavior with the sign, okay? So maybe I will circle this just to be clear. x cubed is what it's going to be for large values of x and it's minus 4x that is going to dictate the behavior near the origin. Okay, so let's take it one piece at a time. Minus 4x, just minus 4x as itself, what does that look like? It's a line and it has a negative slope of minus 4. So that means that minus 4x is going to, near the origin, my graph, or maybe that's too much, is going to look like a line with negative slope. Excellent. Now. For large values of x, we have that x cubed that dictates that behavior. So that means that at far ends, for like um, ne negative infinity and positive infinity, my graph is going to look like x cubed. Okay, 
So of course, x cubed looks like a sneaky function. Um, so overall, uh, let me draw this fully, and then we're going to talk about why I cannot take the whole thing. So overall, it's going to look something like this. But again, remember that my graph is going to behave like this, only for large values. So it's only the ends of this graph that I now have to keep as my function's behavior. Okay, so I can draw, whoops, I can draw in my cubic graph, but the only pieces of it that I will have to keep for my specific function are the ones on the ends. Excellent. And so now we have all of these pieces that we have to put together somehow, right? So at the ends, my graph looks like this. Near the origin, it looks like in line with a negative slope, and it has to go through negative 2, 0, and 2. Okay? Now, once again, we know that the graphs of polynomial functions are nice smooth curves, so I simply have to connect all of these pieces together in a nice continuous curve. Okay? And here, there is no other way to do it than to simply go through negative 2, through the origin along the line, back up through 2, to rejoin my cubic behavior at the end. Okay? Looks pretty good. One um, um, hint, or uh, what's the right word, not hint, but one thing to keep in mind when you're doing these exercises is if something didn't quite work out, if you cannot make your shape fit onto your intercepts, then something probably went wrong with your analysis. So review it back and make sure that you can consolidate all the pieces so that the graph actually satisfies everything. It goes through the necessary um, intercepts, it satisfies the needed behavior at the origin, and it satisfies that behavior at the ends. Okay? So this is it. You guys are going to do more examples in lecture. Um, let's take a look at the other way to put power functions together and yet still be able to use this power analysis. The other types of functions, so the one um, operation that the polynomial functions do not include essentially is division, right? So the other way to uh, make a complex function is to, do, to introduce a division. Rational functions are functions of the form p over q, where p and q are both polynomials. So there are things like, you know, um, x cubed minus 4x over 3x plus 2, and so on. Now, once you introduce a division, you have to start being careful because we cannot divide by zero, which means that the bottom can no longer be zero. So now we have a variety of domain um, concerns that we have to be careful about. For rational functions, that just means that we're introducing some types of asymptotes. And once again, if you would like to review that in a little more detail, please take a look at the pre-calculus review package. Um, in this course, one particularly useful type of rational function that we're going to see throughout a number of applications are going to be so-called Hill functions. And they're the functions of this form. So not just any polynomial type over any polynomial type, but a specific one type of power function, just a coefficient and a power function, divided by um, a number a constant plus x to the n. And notice that my x to the n, the powers on the top and the bottom, are always the same for Hill functions. Um, the Hill functions are actually named after Archibald Hill, um, which was a British uh, physiologist. In fact, he won a 1922 Nobel Prize for his work in um, production of heat and mechanical uh, work in muscles. Um, and these functions, again, one of the biggest strengths of math is that once you have a function, it actually turns out to model many things, but mathematical analysis for this function will always be the same. So let's take a look at how we can use our form, uh, dominating power analysis to now apply to these um, Hill functions. Um, here's the first example. Again, take a look at the function first, and maybe go back one slide and persuade yourself that this is in fact a Hill function and not uh, that it satisfies the right pattern to be a Hill function. Okay, so um, here we're going to apply power analysis, so I'm going to um, uh, record this a little more carefully because now we have denominator and numerator and there's a lot more pieces, okay? So for small values of x, which means that whatever this is is going to be the behavior near the origin, 
versus four large values of x. Okay, and so um, with this, let's take a look at our function. So I'm just going to rewrite my function here. And I'm going to say approximately now because I will be figuring out which terms I get to keep near the origin, which ones will dominate, and which ones I can actually let go of. So my function to begin with looks like this, 5x squared, 1 plus x squared. Okay. Now once again, remember that for small values of x, small powers dominate. So I can keep only the smallest powers, and they will dictate the relation, uh, the, what the function looks like near the origin. Okay, now this is where you actually get to analyze the numerator and denominator separately. So let's take a look at the numerator, 5x squared. Well, numerator only has the one thing, so I don't really have a choice of the highest power or the lowest power. There's only one power, so I'm going to have to keep the 5x squared no matter what. Okay, so I guess I can rewrite that, 5x squared, because there's nothing else on top. On the bottom, though, I have 1 plus x squared. So I have two terms, and again, for small values, small powers dominate. So out of these two terms, I have to pick the one with the smallest power of x. Now, it's a little tricky, probably, because it seems that like this has a power of x and this doesn't at all, and that's true. So you can think of this one as x to power 0, because anything to power 0 is 1, right? So now, if you're looking at these two terms, the one with the smallest power of x is, of course, this one, because it's x to power 0, and that's the one I'm going to keep. For small powers, or for small values, I keep small powers, okay? So I can cross out my x squared, because for small powers, I am not going to keep the larger ones. So I have 5x squared over 1, or just 5x squared. For large values of x, I'm going to go through the exact same analysis, except I'm going to now keep the large powers and let go of all of the smaller ones. Okay, so let me rewrite my function fully once again, and then decide what do I keep and what do I let go of. And once again, I'm going to do my analysis separately on top and bottom. So on the top, I have 5x squared. Again, same issue. There's nothing to pick from. So I'm stuck with the 5x squared. Okay, so I'm just going to rewrite that. What about the bottom? Here I have 1 plus x squared. For large values, I get to keep large powers. And x squared is the larger power. So I can cross off my 1 and keep the x squared. Now, this is excellent news because, in fact, this can be further simplified, right? So, x squares will cancel, and I get that for large values of x, my function looks approximately like 5. What can be simpler than that? Let's try to sketch all of our findings here. Now, I should mention that while normally in mathematics we sketch over the entire domain, for a lot of functions that are most useful in applications, um, it is only the positive values that are actually going to be reasonable to consider. So you notice here that it says specifically for x greater or equal than 0, because it's only going to be for uh, positive, let's say, heat production, which is what Hill studied, that this function is going to make any sense at all. Okay, So I'm only going to sketch it for positive values of x. And so that affects a little bit how I draw my axes to begin with, right? I don't need to draw the negative um, side of the Cartesian plane at all. So let's say this is my x, this is my y. And now let's try to put all these pieces together. So what I have is for small values of x, my function looks like 5x squared. What does 5x squared look like? It's a parabola. Um, the coefficient is 5, so it's positive. So it's upside um, upside looking parabola, right? So what I have here is that near the origin my function looks like this. Let me label this. So this guy looks like 5x squared. Fantastic. What about for large values of x? I know that for large values of x my function looks like 5. What does y equals 5 look like? Well, it's y, so let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. y equals 5 looks like a horizontal line, 
right? So I know that for large values of x, my function will look like 5. Okay, so let me label this guy as well. Now, the one thing I'm not telling you yet, and we don't really have tools for that yet, and this is what calculus will really help us develop, is that for positive values of x, hill function is also going to be a nice smooth curve. For positive x's here, it will have no vertical asymptotes, no holes, no unexpected jumps. So now, essentially, what I get to do is connect my two pieces of a parabola and the horizontal line in some kind of continuous and smooth manner. And there seems to be only one way to do so, and that is to start a parabola here and then continue off and approach my line, or rather, let's just be a little more specific. So for the analysis that I have so far is that it will eventually become that line. Calculus will let us figure out more precise ways to draw this graph. So for example, um, it will tell us what that really means at the end. Will the function ever become a line or will it just approach the line? Um, but so far, with very few tools, we've already been able to sketch a fairly accurate um, graph of this function by just using power analysis.